Hello everyone, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane and I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to come watch The Vine, our online campus here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Today you're going to hear a great, great story from Pastor In Sue. Um, it's entitled, How She Grew Up, A Korean Girl to Become a United Methodist Pastor. She's going to tell you her story and the transformation that has taken place in her life, all because of the way that God is working in her life. So um, hang with us for the next 35, 40 minutes, and you're going to hear a great, inspiring story that I'm sure is going to lift you up through the rest of this week. Thanks for joining us today. Will you bow your heads for our opening prayer? Gracious God, give to us the mind of Christ, who loved God and loved his neighbor, who healed the sick, fed the hungry, and prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him. May we follow his path in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Good morning. My name is Donna Hickman. Thank you for letting me share my testimony with you today. Last week, Jeff Turpin told us the story of his coming to church life, to fellowship, and to a relationship with Christ. And it was a bit later in life. He told us the cute story of how when Jan came to be a cashier at Winn-Dixie, he um, was very smitten, and she ultimately introduced him to church. My story is a bit different from that. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. My parents and my family took that proverb very seriously. I was taught from an early, early age to pray before meals with God is great, God is good. It was an epilogue to my day with now I lay me down to sleep and God blessing everybody that I knew or had ever come in contact with. From the time I was about three years old, four years old, my persistent father had taught me to say the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed, which I proudly recited standing on the pew in the church, probably saying that God's name was Halloween instead of Hallowed. But still, I was a very proud little girl that he had taught me how to say those big speeches and prayer. Along with Chicken Little and the Little Red Hen, Bible stories were my bedtime stories. I loved Noah's Ark, Moses and the Burning Bush, and my favorite story was that of David and Goliath. We had a Hurlbut's illustration storybook, and the illustration of David was standing over Goliath after he had already taken the giant down using his sling and a stone and was wielding the giant's own sword getting ready to finish the job. I became an instant lover of the underdog, that with God's help, all things were possible. It's why I still occasionally believe and have hope that the UNC Tar Heels may one day have a championship football team. With God, all things are possible. We were the second car parked at church every Sunday morning. We sat in the same pew for early morning worship before Sunday school followed. We attended. Um, the church after Sunday school, the, the main sermon. And then we had a big Sunday lunch, either at my mother's house, my mom and dad's house, or at my grandmother's house. I attended vacation Bible schools, perhaps like no other child ever has. I grew up in Cumberland County in North Carolina, um, just outside of Fayetteville, and I grew up in a country church called Galatia. I went to Galatia's vacation Bible school, I went to a local Baptist church vacation Bible school. My grandmother who lived in Sampson County, I went to her vacation Bible school. And I had a great aunt who belonged to a church of God. I also went to her vacation Bible school. I still have a ruler that I meant to bring today and forgot that I won at that vacation Bible school when I was about seven years old. 
in middle and high school and college, I stayed connected. I, I was very active in the church and youth groups and um, doing all those interfaith things that we did together at the time. When I finished college, I returned home to Fayetteville and I married Eric and we continued to be active in the church. But then Eric's banking career took us to, um, called us to other towns. We um, actually, we moved six different times uh, between 1993 and 2005. During those years, we still attended church, but we never quite plugged in. I wasn't involved in the true fellowship of the church and serving and study. We sort of blended into the background. No one was looking for us on a particular pew or asking us to serve in any capacity. We just kind of showed up most of the time on Sunday mornings. When my mother moved into assisted living, she had to get rid of some of her furniture and she was very insistent that I take on a cherry glass fronted secretary that she loved very much and didn't have room for. And I thought, what am I gonna fill these shelves with? I realized we had all of these Bibles tucked around our house on bookshelves and in closets and in cabinets and different places. And I thought, well, this would be a nice display cases for all of those Bibles. I got sort of tickled looking at all the varieties of Bibles we had. We had revised Standard Bibles, King James, NIVs, Oxford Bibles, Living Bibles, Bibles that I had been given at certain grade levels for high school graduation, for college graduations. I even had a Bible printed in 1844 that belonged to an ancestor who had fought in the Civil War. I'm told I have an accent. I can't hear it. But given that you may be able to discern that, you may decide which side my ancestor likely fought. My favorite Bible was a zip-up white Bible with the words of Jesus in red that I'd asked for one Christmas that I still have to this day. Still has a bookmark I made at a church camp. But what I realized as I was looking through and pulling all of these Bibles together is that they all shared one thing in common. None of them had been read lately. They were all a bit dusty. I knew that it was time to plug back in because I felt a little sick and ashamed about that fact. I started here at Wrightsville Methodist with Alpha, which was a class we offered at the time. It was an easy, fun way to fellowship with other members of the congregation. We got together, we had dinner, we watched a video, we shared, we discussed, we laughed, and we learned. It was an awesome start to my plugging back in. I then went to some six week and seven week ladies Bible studies that were, the first two anyway, were hosted by Ann Jenkins and Sherry Engel, both of whom still teach, both of whom are still amazing Bible teachers. I love taking their classes. Following that, I took some Advent studies, um, Lenten studies with pastors usually, and finally committed to the disciple classes that Jeff Turpin also told us about last week that he had committed to um, going through when he talked about those purple and the yellow book and the green book. Um, they are true commitments to study for about a year long period of time, a school year period of time anyway. I went from attending worship to being a part of this church family and strengthening my connection and relationship with God and Christ, being in fellowship with other believers, Today, I want to invite you to do the same thing. If you're not already involved in small study groups or uh, the women's circles or the men's United Methodist Fellowship, I encourage you to do that. It really does make you feel a part of a family as opposed to just a visitor. Even if you're a member, sometimes we can feel a little bit like visitors if we don't know enough of the folks around us not to mention strengthening that relationship with Christ is our ultimate and most important thing to do. So if it's stopping you that you don't think you know enough about the Bible, don't let that be a hindrance to you. There'll be no quizzes and nobody will laugh if you don't know the answer to something. In fact, nobody will know you don't know the answer. If you are a little shy about it, believe me, so am I. So just bolster up that courage and maybe grab a friend and, and take that friend and, and just come, come visit us and, and see what a class is like. Too busy, I can understand. Most of us are very busy. 
I would encourage you to understand that if you don't get all the homework done for a class, it is not a problem. If you don't make every class, it's not a problem. We just want you to come when you can and do what you can and come and learn with us whenever you're able to. If you feel like no one's invited you, consider this your invitation today. Please come. The bulletin board is chock full of opportunities. The weekly email blast is as well. There are inserts in your bulletin that will tell you all about different times and studies that are available to you. I encourage you and I encourage the, those of you who are already in study to encourage one another, to invite a friend, to bring somebody with you to the next study that you sign up for. Please come and join us. Thank you. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to Join me again for prayer. Dear God, we ask that you would fan into flame the global body of Christ so that its heartbeat to make disciples beat strongly. Transform us as we read your word this day and pray for the good news of Jesus to be amplified as a song of praise in our lives. Use us in our homes, our workplaces, our schools, our clubs our ministries, and throughout our community for the sake of loving God with all our hearts, minds, and souls, and loving our neighbors with all the grace and mercy that you give. Lord, each and every day we have new petitions on our hearts. We watch the news, we hear stories from our friends and family, and we worry about those whom we love that are facing struggles. Bend low this day and share your healing touch with our broken world. Where there is war, bring peace. Where there is sickness, bring a cure. Where there is injustice, bring mercy, fairness, and grace. We especially ask that you will bless all those we lift up now on our lips and on our hearts. Gracious and loving God, we ask for your will in this world and that we would have the humility to bend to it. Use us as your instruments to spread the gospel in word and deed as we pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we invite you to take a minute to reflect on the ways that God has given himself to you and ways that you might be able to give a portion uh, back to him. And so today we invite you to go to rightsfulumc.org and there's a 
a page there, uh, right there on the front page, where you can give to the ministries of Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and we thank you for your generosity. Hey boys and girls, it's Pastor Doug here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church and I'm really glad to be able to talk to you about Jesus today. In fact, that's exactly what I want to talk about. Jesus himself tells us in this important Bible verse that Pastor and Sue is going to share a little bit later that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. Well, how are we going to make disciples of Jesus Christ of all nations? I don't think I'm going to be able to go to all the nations of the world. Well, I'm not sure that I have to. I think maybe if I tell one person about Jesus, maybe they'll tell somebody about Jesus, and on and on and on and on. So pretend I'm this domino, okay? And as a domino, I'm going to go and tell the next domino about Jesus. And as each person falls in love with Jesus, um, maybe they'll go and tell somebody else. And let's see how that would work. I only need to tell one person, and yet they'll tell a lot of people. Ready? Let's see how it goes. Hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. Will you tell somebody else about Jesus? Okay, and so let's see what happens. Everybody got to hear about Jesus. Isn't that cool? Wow! So all I had to do was tell one person, and then they told somebody, and they told somebody, and they told somebody until it got around the whole world. That's pretty cool. And so that's what I invite you to do, is to share the love of Jesus with just one other person, and then maybe the whole world will know about the love of Jesus. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for Jesus and we ask that we might be more like him and that you would give us the courage to tell others about him and about how much he loves us. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eunsoo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. As we have a camp meeting month, um, each one of us pastors have been sharing our personal faith journeys, especially how we were called to be um, the United Methodist pastors. And today it is my great privilege to take time for sharing my personal journey, a journey that took me um, from being a little girl in the Korean Methodist Church to standing here as your pastor in the United Methodist Church. This is not just my story, it is God's story. So my hope is that as I share my testimony, you will see the hand of God that has guided me and continues to guide each one of us. Today's past scripture passage is from Matthew chapter 28, verses from 19 to 20. Now hear the word of God. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Speak through me and always beyond me so that your word might be heard by your people this day through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I grew up as a pastor's kid. My dad is a pastor in the Korean Methodist Church. As the story goes, my first word I said after mom and dad was, hallelujah. When I was just a year old and had just started walking, every Sunday I would sit next to my mom during worship service. 
and as soon as my dad finished the benediction, I would sprint down the aisle, give him a big hug, and turn around and raise my hand and shout hallelujah to the old congregation, then proudly walk out with my dad during the recessional. In the Korean church, we didn't just have Sunday services. We had 5 a.m. early morning services every day, Wednesday evening services, Friday night services, Saturday children youth activities, choir practice, praise band rehearsal, and three services with small group activities on Sundays. Naturally, I spend more time at church than at home. So you might think this naturally led to a calling for me to become a pastor, but no. I never imagined I would end up preaching one day. You see, I had seen too closely what it took to be a pastor. The sacrifices, the late night praying with tears, the endless love and care for the congregation and writing sermon every week. It seemed like too heavy a burden for me. How could I, just a young girl, possibly have the strength or faith to live that kind of life? But life does not always go as we plan. When I was 15, everything changed. My mom was diagnosed with cancer, and the doctors told us she had only a year to live. The news was like a punch in the gut. At first, I couldn't believe that. Then came the deep sadness, and then the anger. I kept asking God, why? Why is this happening to us? Haven't I been a good daughter and a good pastor's kid? I never missed Sunday worship service, on Sunday school, played the piano for worship service, forgave the kids who hurt me, and even cleaned the church restrooms every week. So why? Why is this happening? And in my anger, I decided I needed to confront God. So I started reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation very carefully, determined to find something, anything to argue with God. So back then, my goal was to read all 66 books and gather logical evidence from the Bible and confront God with it, saying, God, you made a mistake. You owe me and my family an apology, so now fix this situation. But God had a different plan. As I read, something unexpected happened. As I turned each page of the Bible, and as I learned more about how God worked throughout history, God met me in those pages, not as some distant figure, but as a loving parent who knew me personally. I began to see that God's love was not something I had to earn. I was not loved and accepted by God because I never missed a service, cleaned the church restrooms well, or forgave my friends. It was a gift, freely given, long before I knew God. As Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And that verse became real to me. I realized that my worth was not in what I did, but in who I was, a beloved child of God. This understanding changed everything. It was as if the scales had fallen from my eyes and I could see clearly for the first time. Honestly, life was not easy at the time. The Korean high school system demanded that I study from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., Monday through Saturday. My mom was in the hospital for over a year and my dad was constantly going back and forth between the hospital and the church. Most of all, there was no guarantee that my mom would regain her health. So every day 
was filled with fear and anxiety. But my heart toward God had changed. I believed that no matter what happened tomorrow, God would not abandon me. Even if I had to face something unbearable, like saying goodbye to my mom, I knew that I would not be able to handle it on my own. But because of God, who created me and knows me better than I know myself, would give me the strength and comfort to embrace it. I had that insurance. And miraculously, my mom survived her battle with cancer, and she is still healthy today, full of life, and watching this vine every week and giving me critical feedback about my tone, gestures, and more. But more than her physical healing, what really changed was my heart. I didn't want to argue with God anymore, and I wanted to Him more deeply. And this led me to Methodist Theological University, where I began to study theology and discover the richness of Methodist teachings. These teachings deepened my understanding of God, especially the idea that grace is for all, even before we realize it, as Pastor David and Pastor Doug elaborate in the past two weeks. And one day, while browsing in the school library, I came across a history book that would change my life again. It told the story of the first Methodist missionaries from America to Korea. Henley Appenzeller, Dr. William Scranton, and Mary Fletcher Scranton. In June 1885, they came to Korea, a land so foreign and far away from their own, to share the gospel. Henry Appenzeller, just a 26-year-old, a Princeton graduate, dedicated his life to theological education, church planting, and translating Bible into Korean. The seminary he established became the first theological university in Korea and the first co-educational school in the country's history. That was not just a school. It was a beacon of the gospel's power to grant dignity and freedom to every life. And that school is Methodist Theological University where I graduated. This university has produced thousands of pastors and theologians, contributing to the fact that Korea now hosts the world's largest Methodist church and has become the second largest missionary sending country globally. The churches Henry planted, the first Methodist churches in Korea are in Seoul and my hometown of Incheon. These two churches are still referred to as the mother churches of the Korean Methodist Church. The publishing house he established to translate and distribute the Bible have grown into the largest Christian published company in the country, enabling me to read God's word in my native language. So as I read about his ministry, I couldn't help but wonder what kind of faith drives someone to leave everything behind, to cross an ocean, to land where everything is different, language, culture, customs, food, just to share the love of Christ. Henry could have lived a more comfortable life in America, but instead he chose to face persecution and hardship out of love for a people he had never met. And this story didn't just inspire me, it called me. That night, I stayed up reading everything I could find about the United Methodist Church and its mission. And the United Methodist Church's mission statement deeply resonated me. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ 
for a transformation of the world. And this mission statement is based on today's scripture, Jesus' grace, Great Commission. And then a week later, as if it were meant to be, I found myself interning at the Scranton Center, which carries on the legacy of Mary Scranton, the first female missionary sent by United Methodist Women. At the age of 52, 52, she chose to serve in Korea. Her missionaries focused on supporting Korean women, establishing schools, hospitals, churches, and institutions and that are now recognized globally. One of her famous diary interests read, whether my work is appreciated by the people of this land, Korea, or not, I have decided to love them. It became a guiding light for me during my three years at Scranton Center. The Scranton Center now continues her work by offering scholarship programs and leadership development for female students in Asia, Africa, and even the United States. And during my three years of working at the center, I couldn't stay idle for a single day. I was deeply moved by the selfless sacrifice made by God's people from the United States and Korea, especially from the United Methodist Church. Haley Appenzeller, Dr. William Scranton, and Mary Scranton, none of them returned to the United States. They were buried in Korea. Their story profoundly impacted me, and I realized that just as those early missionaries had sown the seeds of faith in my homeland, I too was called to sow seeds of love and grace in my ministry by dedicating my life to the mission of the church. My heart was filled with a deep desire to pay back this grace to their descendant, you. We, the United Methodist Church, believe the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This mission is not just something we do. It is how we respond to God's grace, to reach out to those who have not yet heard the good news of God's love. Jesus' great commission reminds us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This mission, rooted in grace, is at the heart of the United Methodist Church. It's a mission that transcends borders cultures, and languages. It was this mission that brought the gospel to Korea, transforming lives and communities and entire country. And it's this mission that continues to drive my ministry today here in this land. This mission is not just about making converts. It's about being the hands and feet of Christ in a world that desperately needs his love. As I reflect on my journey, I can see how God has been at work, not just in my life, but in the lives of those who came before me the missionaries who brought the gospel to Korea, and the countless individuals who have dedicated their lives to the mission of the church. This mission is not something we accomplished on our own. It's God's ongoing work, and it's collective effort, supported by His grace, 
and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Our journey of God's mission does not stop with just one generation. This is not a journey we take our own. It's a journey that God walks with us, providing us with the grace. Just as the seed of mission planted 150 years ago by your ancestors bear fruit in a young Asian female pastor today, it continues by God's grace. And this grace helps us grow in our relationship with God and with others and enable us to keep participating in God's work and pass this legacy on to the next generation. So as we grow in grace, we are reminded that we are always under construction continuously shaped and molded by God's hands. And this growth is not just for our own sake, but for the sake of the world. Even the smallest act of participation in God's work on this journey, no matter how tiny, can impact someone's life, change someone's heart, and ultimately transform the world. My journey from the Korean Methodist girl to the United Methodist pastor has been one of grace. God's grace for all. A mission that crosses borders and a growth that continues to sanctify me every day. I stand before you today not because of anything I have done, but because of what God has done in me and through me. So my prayer is that you, too, will experience this grace and embrace this mission we are all called to be and continue to grow in your walk with God. May we all be seeds planted in the fertile soil of God's love, growing in peace and grace, and bearing fruit for the transformation of this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you for the grace that has guided our steps and shaped our lives. As we continue on this journey, may we be filled with your spirit, empowered to sow seeds of your love and grace in every heart we encounter. Help us to carry forward the mission you have entrusted to us, transforming lives and reflecting your love in all we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Beloved Riceville, remember, your participation in God's work, whether it is small or big, God works through it. So let's keep walking this journey together. Let us go forth to make disciples of Jesus Christ for a transformation of the world. May our God of love and peace, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go with you and stay with you this day and forevermore. Amen.